Assalamualaikum, um, everyone. Uh, welcome to another um, session of our webinar. This uh, is, as you know, ongoing uh, our Apna Merit effort to uh, educate, uh, particularly our colleagues in uh, in um, Pakistan who are clinicians who are dealing with COVID nineteen patients or who want to learn more about COVID nineteen. As you know that. Um, America is at the forefront uh, in, unfortunately, uh, we have the most cases in the world, we have most death in the world. So obviously our, our uh, consultants um, are, uh, you know, more uh, experienced in that way, uh, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully things will better, get better and hopefully Pakistan will not need that kind of uh, extra response, but if uh, it's all about preparedness, we would like our colleagues in Pakistan to be prepared for a time when uh, it can be just blown over. So with that, um, I will um, ask the speaker to introduce himself and then uh, later on we'll introduce our panelist. So go ahead, Fawad, please introduce yourself and topic. Thank you, Shahid Bhai. Fawad Chaudhary, um, I am interventional pulmonologist and intensivist in sleep um, at the University of Oklahoma, currently serving as assistant professor there. Uh, we have had some uh, decent cases of COVID, so I thought I'll share um, the experience. Also, I've been, um, I've been in some of these, uh, many of these uh, discussions, Along the way, while I was preparing it, I've tried to answer a lot of questions that I felt had been asked in the last few days and had been answered. But there have been different um, background of people or physicians that, you know, that, that, that are joining us in general. So it will be probably 25 minutes off or a little less than that, but hopefully it will have a lot of answers that uh, many have been asking. So um, I should start now, right, Shaidan? Gigi, sure. All right, so let's see uh, why my presentation is not moving forward. That's interesting. Okay, so. All right, so um, as I said, um, I'm gonna go a bit quick. Uh, Objective-wise, I have the literature review of these rapidly changing guidelines. I wanna answer some of the commonly asked questions. I'm gonna discuss the guidelines, treatment guidelines in the US and um, the protocols which are institution specific. Um, and then we can, how we can apply those protocols in Pakistan as well. So um, with that, I'm gonna jump on, uh, I'm having some difficulty. Okay, basically, uh, what are the biological characteristics? I'm gonna quickly go over SARS-CoV-2, single-stranded um, RNA, uh, spread from humans to, uh, uh, basically spread to humans from the Nordic, uh, likely bats, there is a reference to the paper. In all my slides, what I'm talking about, there are references. So I think we can later on put these slides for, uh, you know, for the people who like to kind of take a look at it uh, later on. R routes of infection, other than, of course, person-to-person -person respiratory droplet, there is contact and enteric route has been described. Um, and the virus can uh, get shed in pieces for up to like 21 to 28 days with, with some reports. Incubation period is 3 to 12 days. Uh, with a median duration of viral shedding of about 20 days. And um, there has been reports, the initial reports of virus binding to ACE2 receptors on type 2 pneumocytes. But again, we'll talk about uh, the role of ACE inhibitors and ARP later on. Um, and all these references are very high use studies that I put it down there. Uh, quickly about some epidemiology. Attack rate, which is kind of um, uh, how many at-risk individuals can get exposed um, by one index case is 30 to 40 percent. Case fatality that has been rapidly changing, but this, um, the study from where I got it was about two weeks, uh, about 10 days before. So that was about 1.5 percent, which is slightly higher at this point. And overall, three to four percent. And we discussed about the incubation that has been previously asked, question three to 14 days, and virus shedding that has been previously asked is up to 20, 21 days, and the study reference is there. Very common, uh, nearly 85% of these patients does have fever and persistent fevers, up to 10, 12 days of fever is commonly seen. 80% of those patients also have cough. Fatigue is up to 
Um, and then about 10%, I think a few days ago, somebody asked about GI symptoms. So again, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea is about 10%. So that is, again, the reference to the studies there. Uh, it would be good to take a look at. But cough, fever, fatigue, these are the main symptoms they're presenting with. Lab abnormalities, all of us know lymphopenia, 80% uh, of the patients do have that. Elevated BUN and creatinine and ASD, ALT, especially ASD, ALT, very commonly seen. Um, and then uh, if they have high C-reactive protein and ferritin, uh, then they do have it, but if, if it keeps on increasing, that goes with the worsening of the disease. Um, elevated D-dimers, interleukin-6, and lactate dehydrogenase, um, LDH. These are all the um, common lab abnormalities that have been seen repeatedly, um, and they should be monitored on a daily basis. I have some protocol at the end, which we use at our university, and that I will share with you guys. Imaging findings, um, I'll go quickly. I think we have discussed previously, they can present without any imaging abnormality. Um, however, um, so if the index of suspicion is high, please still think about it. When they are getting into the more advanced phase, chest X-ray can show um, bilateral institutional edema. CT scan can show VGOs, um, consolidations. And uh, B-lines and plural thickening with uh, focus of point of care ultrasound that again is commonly used in many institutions so they don't have to get to the CT scan. Um, important to assess the cardiac function at certain reports um, and recent papers have suggested 32% involvement of cardiac um, uh, or cardiac involvement. So that's also important. These are the go-to investigations, sparing the CT scan um, that can be done um, for these patients suspected of COVID. Uh, how do we test once you're suspecting, um, of course, nasopharyngeal swab or SARS-CoV-2? Um, and then, again, remember, uh, co-infection co is common. Uh, quite a few times you will find more than 10% of the cases will have a co-infection. So do the PCR20 and BioFi for influenza and other um, adenovirus and other viruses as well. And, of course, treat accordingly if you're influenza positive as well. Do not order sputum induction and do not do a bronchoscopy um, unless absolutely indicated. Uh, the bronchoscopy indications I'll uh, discuss um, or uh, intervention indications the next slide uh, according to ABIC. Uh, similarly, do not do PFTs or spirometry, not on these patients. And when the COVID is there, um, elective PFTs um, are also not recommended. Uh, by both ATS and occupational medicine because of the risk of asymptomatic patients shedding the virus. And of course, notify your health department. Okay. And um, this is the ABIP recommendations for the procedures. So the only procedures we are doing at this point is the emergent ones. And those mostly fall in interventional category like severe uh, tracheal stenosis or a mass uh, on the trachea that you may have to do a rigid, but we are doing it kind of one a week that kind of falls on uh, under pepper as opposed to N95. Massive hemoptysis, migration of stent, uh, these are some of the emergent uh, indications uh, for bronchoscopy. The more gray area urgent um, bronchoscopic indications are, um, for example, uh, BEL requirement immunosuppressed patients. We are trying to avoid it if they are clinically improving by giving a couple of weeks of antibiotics for seven days and see how they are doing while in the hospital. Foreign body aspiration, depending on where it is, that can be considered an urgent one. Uh, mediastinal and hyaluronic adenopathy and lung mass is suspicious for cancer. These are kind of uh, rather urgent indications, and we are doing it in a low volume, especially in those patients where it's going to change the management. For example, if the patient, we don't do it, it's gonna go from a resectable case to non-resectable case, you will consider it. But certain cases when you have a suspicion between sarcoidosis and lymphoma and things like that, you can delay. So these are the only indications I would recommend, emergent and urgent that you consider at this point in a low volume and use the air purifying device, which is pepper uh, for these. Um, all right, so uh, going back to the COVID, we kind of discussed clinical lab and chest x-ray quickly, uh, sorry, and the imaging quickly. And then we decided how we're gonna get specimen. We do not need induction. We do not need uh, bronchoscopy in general. Infection control wise, uh, once you have a suspected person, use a droplet, uh, droplet precaution. 
Um, if you have limited space, especially uh, some of the places in Pakistan where um, space is limited, um, you can consider, if you have to cohort, separate the patients two meters. Of course, restrict visitors um, that we are doing it uh, for every patient and every kind of surgery and every uh, illness. Avoid room entry unless essential. Even nurses, uh, they can have um, extension to the IV pump so they don't have to go back and forth in the patient's room. Um, hand hygiene, we all know 20 seconds of hand washing and if you are using the um, alcohol containing gels, it should contain 60 to 90% alcohol. Again, I think that question was asked some time in the last few days. Okay, so what is the appropriate PPE? That has been very commonly asked question. Um, so standard precautions, contact precautions, droplet precautions with eye protection for all the cases PUI as well as um, positive plus airborne precautions. And airborne precautions are by N95 or paper. Now the current recommendations for airborne precautions are for aerosolization, uh, aerosolizing procedures such as intubation, um, NIPTV, open circuit suctioning, bronchoscopy, um, and other aerosol treatments. But we don't recommend open uh, circuit suctioning, and we're kind of trying to avoid NIV anyways. So basically, the intubation, extubation, bronchoscopy, and some of these procedures, uh, they're recommending to use um, airborne precaution. If you have it available, um, then I think it's reasonable to use it, uh, just going in and out, um, and for the rest of the uh, patient care as well, but if you don't, at least in those procedures, uh, N95 is needed. Um, and all healthcare professionals should be trained in how to properly don and off, especially while taking off the PPE, the contamination risk is higher. Multiple studies have shown that. So, um, so that's important, and also, of course, some fit test is important. For people with beard, like myself, um, when I'm, I'm taking care of ICU patients last week, I didn't um, so I had it all shaved and with a little specific recommendations, but still I was using pepper if you have any facial hair, um, okay, because N95 will not fit. Now I'm going to go over the treatment recommendations and some of the recent studies. Um, yeah. um, and again, I, I wanted to give you some bullet points of what we need to do. If you have somebody and somebody in the fellows and new trainees, they want to see how we are doing it. So they have the bullet point presentation, what we need to do. Do the RDS management, fluid sparing technique, um, use Tylenol. Um, I talked about the ACE inhibitor um, or ACE receptors um, and virus affinity. Um, again, for American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association, there is no recommendation to discontinue. If they are on ACE or ARB, continue until anything um, else comes up at this point. Um, what about the cardiomyopathy? Again, this is a recent paper uh, published uh, in JAMA. It showed up to 32, 33% of patients did have um, cardiomyopathy. So um, very important to uh, point of care ultrasound um, and uh, you know, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, DVT prophylaxis, again, um, the, the, these patients are highly thrombogenic, so consider at least DVT prophylaxis. I have a couple papers on that as well. Corticosteroids uh, with uh, WHO and CDC, there is no recommendation. They recommend it not to use it, except if the patient has asthma or COPD exacerbation, along with COVID, and in patients who have refractory shock. However, SCCM did um, give recommendation to use in cytokine, the cytokine storm in severe ARDS cases, which is a weak recommendation, but they have a recommendation. And I have certain slides, and I do think there's an important point here that we will discuss further, how and why and when we can use steroids in COVID-19. Um, uh, was there a question or, um, I don't know, I heard something in the background. So I'd no, go ahead. Okay, so I, I think we, okay. we are going to take uh, questions at the end of uh, your yes, talk. I agree. Uh, I agree. All right. So um, now uh, these are the general treatment recommendations. Then we go to hypoxemic respiratory failure. As mentioned, if they are not very hypoxemic, start with the nasal cannula. Non rebreather can be tried. Consider early intubation as opposed to BiPAP or CPAP, uh, multiple society recommendations. Now, if you have to intubate, use rapid sequence intubation technique, which means paralyze those patients first. Of course, make sure with paralysis that you can ventilate those patients. 
uh, rather than just using sedation because uh, huffing and puffing and cough can lead to a lot of cough effects. So rapid sleep sedation is a recommended way from multiple societies. Use video laryngoscopy if possible. Of course, direct can be used, but video laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy can be considered, but video is the quicker one. Um, minimize circuit breaks, as I mentioned. And uh, when the patients are intubated, use the lung protective ventilation strategies, just like uh, we follow for uh, with ARDS and protocol. Prone and paralyze as needed. Now, if lung protective strategy, prone paralysis, despite all that patient is worsening, consideration of ECMO, okay? So this is how basically we're gonna treat these patients. And then we'll talk about some uh, investigational therapy. There has been a lot of online stuff going on, whether this is true ARDS or not ARDS, multiple theories. Um, do not believe them unless you have a full uh, literature review. I wanted to put that slide, um, top of the slide, the COVID-19 pneumonia. This mention, uh, I think that was published in JAMA or something, um, that showed two variants of ARDS. They described an L to H variant, L variant where the lung compliance usually in ARDS is very low, um, along with hypoxemia, it matches hypoxemia. They mentioned that initially these patients have a high compliance uh, and they should not be treated with high PEEP and typical ARDS strategies. Once a patient gets converted into an H variety, which is low compliance, along with severe hypoxemia, then they require all that. And then the bottom line, there is a link. There is a very uh, good commentary on why these patients have two ARDS. They can have the two variants, but they could represent the same spectrum of disease as we all know in ARDS. Bottom line, what I want to point out, uh, that has been asked by multiple other subspecialty physicians to me that is it ARDS or something else? It is ARDS. The definition of ARDS is within a week of insert, bilateral pulmonary infiltrate, severe hypoxemia, low PF ratio, and excess of cardiogenic shock. This is ARDS. And the pathophysiology of leaky capillary is ARDS as well. So these patients are going to ARDS, but again, I will uh, leave it here. It's a whole different topic in debate these references are good to read to kind of understand what's going on. Okay. After this therapy, which is general therapy and ARDS therapy, what are the investigational approaches? Um, FP approved drugs, we all know chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, they are being used as off-label. Uh, there has been some initial data suggesting uh, that hydroxychloroquine blocks viral entry to the endosome, and in vitro data suggests some utility, however, RCTs are lacking. There's a recent uh, negative study that I'll um, go over in the next couple of slides. Uh, other investigational agents that are available in use um, for use are remdesivir, which is an antiviral lymphocyte analog. Use it. We are using it along with, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not a compassionate use anymore, it's for trial. Lopinavir and ratonavir now has a negative study, uh, so we are not recommending it at this point until further data is available. Tocilizumab is an IL-6 inhibitor, and there was a positive study uh, withdrawal of tocilizumab um, in China, and uh, that has um, many centers are using, including ours, and I think it's a very good uh, response. So basically, at this point, on desipid, tocilizumab, I'll talk about steroids, and chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine is still being used despite some questionable data so far. Um, <clears throat> now, I uh, just wanted to throw it out there. Just a few days ago, this is published in MEGM um, about the uh, initial data of the compassionate use of remdesivir. Um, they had a total of, I think, 50 out of 61 patients. They had a data on 52 patients who did receive uh, remdesivir um, in the United States, Canada, and in Japan, uh, 22 in, I think, Canada, 22 in the United States, and nine in Japan. Very good response. Most of these patients got extubated and the mortality of the patients who were on the ventilator was 13%, and those who were not on the ventilator was 5%. We all know that this is much less than what, is, what has been seen in China, what has been seen in Italy, and what has been seen in US. So I think that's, uh, that's a decent um, uh, response study. I wanna just put a quick um, comment on the chloroquine recent, uh, this is the pre-published data from April 2020. 
So this is looking into hydroxychloroquine um, and its response in the patient, and they had two arms. Uh, 32 patients in a placebo arm and 32 patients in the hydroxychloroquine arm. And they did not find any significant association of hydroxychloroquine um, use and improvement in lymphocyte counts or improvement in any other parameter. In fact, the patients who were given hydroxychloroquine had a higher rate of intubation or respiratory failure. That could be a coexisting, but there was no benefit of choosing hydroxychloroquine. Uh, so this is a rather more recent negative study on hydroxychloroquine. What about tocilizumab that I mentioned? Uh, so this is uh, the earlier data from China that showed um, the use of tocilizumab for suppressing cytokine storm uh, with anti-IL-6. Um, uh, 20 patients that, that received it, 15 of those 20 patients um, did improve their oxygenation. And which was 75%, 90% of those patients had improvement in their CD scan, and 85% of those patients had improvement in their lymphopenia, and um, I believe 80% 80, 80 yeah, the C-reactive protein was also improved in 85%. And 90% uh, of those patients, which were 19, were discharged on an average of 13.5 days. This is a very good study, and um, I'm going to throw it out there that out of Eight patients that we have used, including one patient at 82 years of age, all of them got extubated. Okay, so some of them are still in the hospital, but we have exactly the same matching results with tocilizumab in patients who are given, which I'll go over what are the indications to give tocilizumab. Okay. All right, so this question has been asked a lot as well about what do we do? Should we anticoagulate these patients um, therapeutically uh, because they have high risk? possible high risk of thrombosis. So there is um, a study uh, that's uh, pretty recent as well. I think last one was published, uh, end of uh, March, that showed um, out of 184 patients uh, with proven COVID-19 pneumonia, there was a 31% chance of thromboembolic event, and out of those, 95% were PE. Okay, so they were recommending in their study to have at least a prophylaxis, DVD prophylaxis, but if suspicion is high, then just use uh, for those. Um, however, uh, we have um, um, guidelines from uh, International Society of uh, HEAM that are recommending uh, to use at least prophylactic dose of... Um... Oh, okay, so I just uh, heard that I need to speak louder. So yeah, I'll speak louder. So um, I'm sorry about that if it was not heard before. So um, the, the International Society of HEME, um, the recommendation is to uh, not use, um, uh, oh, so is to use prophylactic dose of uh, Lovanoff, at least. And they are, uh, there was a study of 449 patients, um, uh, and out of those, 100 had received low molecular weight heparin, and they found out that those that received low molecular weight heparin, if they had a high sepsis score and high D-dimer, they did better than those who did not. So at least, use the low molecular weight heparin on all of the patients, and if suspicion is high, therapeutic and regulation can be considered. Okay. What about prognosis? Um, from China's experience, we know that 80% of patients with COVID will be having mild symptoms, 50% moderate and 5% severe requiring mechanical ventilation. And that severe group will have a high mortality, right? 50 to 68% in China, around 60% in Italy, and in US, earlier studies were about 50%, but depending on, on the region, it's different. They deteriorate gradually with a median number of days from symptoms to ICU admission in severe cases of about nine days. Okay? Pregnant women and children appear to have a better prognosis, and there was a recent study that I mentioned on April 3rd that showed about 1.3% um, in, uh, uh, involvement of kids in, in uh, till the data of their US uh, were up to 170,000 cases, which is reassuring. Uh, worse outcomes in patients of increased age, lung comorbidities, cardiovascular com comorbidities, and obesity. Okay. Higher admission sequential organ SOFA score as well, um, so, um, let me just respond. Okay, and then um, if they have high D-dimer ferritin and troponin levels, that is also associated with um, 
basically high uh, or worse outcome. These are the SCCM recommendations regarding the management of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, and I'll just summarize it for you. Uh, basically, same, try to avoid non-invasive ventilation if it can be, early intubation, um, uh, early proning of these patients, um, and then use of neuromuscular blocker recommendation, use of um, inhaled vasodilators, uh, like prostacyclines, only in patients in which neuromuscular paralysis plus um, um, proning is not working. And if all three are not working, then ECMO is recommended. So these are all kind of weak recommendations, but these are the recommendations from, um, from basically um, uh, SCCM that uh, we have discussed previously as well. Now, I'm going to quickly go over, especially for the hospitals which do not have a protocol at this point, I'm going to just throw it out, our uh, protocol. And there are some other online protocols with some um, other centers as well. But take it as you wish, but um, you know, at least this protocol will be on the presentation if somebody wants to um, take it to their hospital. If we have a patient with uh, suspicion or confirmed who's not having any risk factors or oxygen, treat symptomatically. If they have risk factors but no oxygen requirements, consider hydroxychloroquine plus litro. And risk factors we're talking about chronic lung condition, diabetes, hypertension, old age, and others. If they're requiring both oxygen and they have risk factors, uh, then of course, hydroxychloroquine plus zithro we are giving, and we are following their markers to see if they are eligible for cytokine blockage, as well as eligibility for convalescent plasma, okay? I'm gonna skip, skip over this quickly. We are doing all these labs on admission, and then they, every second day or third day, we are repeating um, basically CRP, DIC, ferritin, and LDH, because that's what we are monitoring to see if they will benefit from uh, tocilizumab. The next slide is our indications for IL-6 blockage. They need to be in severe ARDS with a PF ratio below 300 and worsening, of course. The less than 300 is mild, but it's just uh, one of the inclusion. They should be in ARDS. Worsening with uh, regard to their inflammatory markers. And what we are looking at, either uh, three of the number A, which is IL-6 more than 400, CRP above 20, ferritin above 14, D-dimer above 1,000, LDH more than 245. These, um, or if these markers are above 25% of upper limit of normal, and they do not have any significant contraindication. That include more than five times ASG ALT elevation, pregnancy, low platelets, or hypersensitivity to drugs. So these are the general recommendations I, I would say that we look at, and we do it in collaboration of an intensivist and infectious disease expert. Our preferred agent is tocilizumab. You can do one dose, eight milligram per kg, or maybe repeat one time, okay? Uh, there are some, uh, I think, four or five trials on IL-6 currently. So I think that is something that has been tested. But remember, these are expensive medications. Even we were running out after using around six or seven patients. Imaging findings, I will pass over. Remdesivir is in our protocol um, under trial. We are using it on some patients. Um, and then convalescent plasma. We just started our first patient on Friday. So that one of my colleagues started it. Um, I will see what's the outcome on that, but the indications for using convalescent plasma is pretty much similar, as I mentioned, uh, for IL-6, a little bit loose. If they are into going into respiratory failure um, or are already in a life-threatening illness with elevated inflammatory markers, then we are considering them for convalescent plasma based on availability. I'll give this reference. Uh, this is a um, study of five patients uh, who received convalescent plasma. They were all intubated, uh, and this is a study from Wuhan, uh, and all of those patients did good. Three of them were discharged, and I think at the time of the publication of the study, uh, one patient was still there at 37 days, but he was doing well. So all five patients did well with convalescent plasma. So uh, small study with decent results. There's a lot of data about steroids, and I just put these references. This is a study that goes over why and how steroids in viral and non-viral ARDS can help. 
And these are all the various study references that you don't have time to discuss, but I would recommend uh, the audience who has interest to uh, go through these studies that will uh, go over the benefits of steroids in viral and non-viral. So one of the places that is using steroid is Sloan Kettering. Uh, it's a very good institution and um, that's my parent institution. Currently, we are not using it, but they are using it, but I have plans to use it if we have uh, tocitizumab out, but that's um, I just wanted to, that uh, wanted everybody to know that currently I'm not using it, but stone capturing it using it. Okay, so the protocol for steroids is again high inflammatory markers, TRP above 10, elevated ferritin levels up to a thousand, and if IL6 is available, above 400. There should not be a bacterial infection or negative procalcitonin level, no current immunosuppression, and of course severe ARDS. Now, they are using solimedrol 1 milligram per kg for one to two weeks with the taper. The rationale behind steroids is the same as these patients are dying not of virus itself, but dying as a, because of inflammatory storm or cytokine release storm. If you, have, if you do not have tocilizumab and patients are dying because of inflammatory storm with very high CRP level, very high ferritin level, if you have IL-6, then consider those because steroids are cheap and they are available everywhere in England and Pakistan. We had a discussion today with our panel of friends in England and that's what I recommended to them. And there will be a study coming out of Stone Catering, uh, hopefully this week. Uh, I think that would be a good study to look into which has positive effect of, which will have positive effect as per my initial discussions with them of steroids. But again, I don't have the study. This is based on their protocol and it's based on the discussions with them. But there are positive steroid response studies uh, that have been published in 2017 in, in, in one of the previous slides that I mentioned uh, with H1N1 pandemic as well, as well as there are eight or nine RCTs that show steroid benefit in severe RDS. So consider it. So what I would suggest at the end is in Pakistan, if you want to use the protocol like I have or like some other online protocols you'll find in big institutions, use it. But at a time when cytochrome kind storm is there and all the inflammatory markers are high and rising, consider some investigational approaches, just like I mentioned steroids, just like I mentioned tocilizumab and others. And hopefully that might help. Uh, disclosure in our center, um, out of eight patients I mentioned that received, all of them basically are extubated or doing well. And so far, we do not have a mortality, which again, we do not have huge numbers, but um, I think partly is because we have tried all those medications in inflammatory storm, plus we are not overwhelmed our system at that point. Um, so again, I think I'll end my uh, discussion here and I will take questions. Okay, um, thank you uh, for a very detailed and comprehensive uh, presentation. Now I will um, go towards our panelists and ask them to introduce themselves and, and to begin with a very brief um, comment or uh, question, uh, just one, one or two minutes and then we'll come back uh, because we have at least I think five panelists today uh, so um, I would ask uh, Samreen Safraz if you would uh, like to comment. Samreen, go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, can you hear me? Gigi, sure, go ahead. Um, uh, it was a very good lecture. I just want to um, uh, I just want to say that in our center we are also uh, using steroids. Um, because we are seeing severe, whenever we see severe cases where there is an elevation of NDH and CRP and ferritin, we start off with methylprednisolone. And then even in some of them where after 24 to 48 hours of steroids, we are not seeing any improvement. We have used tocilizumab. Um, uh, but the results, of, the results are okay for some. I mean, it's a little premature to say what is happening. Uh, the thing that I would like to comment on is that some of our colleagues at another institute are combining tocilizumab with uh, IVIG. 
uh, I would like to know any experience of this because they say that, uh, I mean, they are a transplant institute and they say that they've dealt with cytokine storm uh, in, in, in their patients otherwise as well. And they say that there is a good experience of IVIG when it is combined with tocilizumab, both given together in severe cases. And they're saying that they're seeing good results with it. So any experience of that? So thank you. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very good question. Um, uh, we do not ourselves have experience of combining IVIG with tocilizumab. I think they are very potent. I would worry that they might get better and get a super infection later. Even with tocilizumab, we worry. Um, I don't think so. There is any study being done with the combination of uh, these two. But I would also ask other panelists, they may know something that I don't. Madhu, do you have any idea, any experience with that? Yeah, I'm a pulmonary critical care physician. Um, excellent talk. Um, no, I don't have any um, experience nor any expert knowledge of that. I would similarly be um, concerned, and especially in Pakistan, you know, in tocilizumab, for instance, uh, any history of latent TB infection, for instance, is a relative contraindication, if not an absolute one. I would very much worry about getting an opportunistic infection, particularly TB. Uh, through the combined use of the two. Okay, let me uh, go to Avas Masood. Avas, please introduce yourself and uh, uh, okay, add. Thank you, Shai. Uh, this is Avas Masood. I'm a nephrologist and intensivist. So again, a very good talk. And I refresh my, uh, I mean, update my knowledge on that. Uh, the, I think uh, compared to uh, two weeks ago and now, uh, pretty much the same treatment we have been using, but I think uh, we are using more anticoagulants now. Uh, majority of the patient in ICU, uh, we are using systemic anticoagulants. Patients who are not have any renal failure, we, we, we give them low NOx. And if a patient has a, a advanced renal failure, we use heparin. And uh, what I have read that heparin and low NOx have also anti-inflammatory uh, action uh, yeah. happening more than Lovenox, but again, Lovenox is easy to give. Uh, again, I don't have any experience with the IgG antibodies giving for this patient. Uh, so that's all I can say. So do you give a therapeutic anticoagulation or is it only pro prophylactic? No, no, not uh, therapeutic, not uh, prophylactic. Pro prophylactic we have been giving uh, to, from the start, but now we are giving a therapeutic. All yeah, right. I, I mentioned one of the studies that did show, um, you know, 31% uh, rate of, you know, thrombosis, and they were recommending therapeutic, but I think it's uh, opinion is split, but nobody will fault you for using therapeutic. I think Dr. Vasmus, they're doing good in that aspect. Um, I think that's reasonable to use therapeutic. But I agree, it's still uh, disputed. I mean, maybe next week uh, we will not be doing it. Uh, I mean, this week but, we are doing it, so. It's no, just, no, I agree. I think, I agree, if you're not gaining ground, I think it's reasonable to do it because they may have a PE. It's such a high rate with these patients, I agree. Actually, we also reviewed uh, the uh, report of biopsy, I mean, actually, autopsy, unfortunately, from Louisiana. They, they published a study from the autopsies done a patient who died from COVID-19 pneumonia, and most of the patients showed that. Nothing surprised, we already know that they have more like a thrombotic events, micro, uh, thrown by most of the patient. So that's and whatever else, else experience we have. So based on that, we are using a systemic or a therapeutic okay. treatment for the patient okay. and the coordinates. Okay, let me introduce, uh, <clears throat> let me ask uh, Mohammed Saleem. I think he's joining from Pakistan and from, I think, Kotli. That's why I wanted him to have a chance to introduce and, uh, and, uh, be our panelist. Mohammed Slim, please go ahead. Mohammed Slim, consultant physician from DHQ Kotli, Azad Jammu and Kashmir. All right, so we can probably try again. Um, Asma Chima, go ahead, uh, introduce yourself and, and uh, comment. Assalamu alaikum everyone. 
My name is Asma Chima. I am practicing internal medicine in Maryland. And Dr. Fawad Chowdhury is very nice talk. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, I want to ask about ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, uh, in the life-saving therapy in patients with COVID in the severe ARDS. Is someone is using it, or do you think anyone is using it? What are your comments? Well, about uh, yeah. So thank you so much um, um, for um, this good question. Um, we have our team available for it. We have not used in our center. There is a weak recommendation from SCCM. If everything fails, consider that. I'm not sure if any of the other panelists have in their center used ECMO yet. Yeah, yeah, so this is a VASM. So in our center, we are using it. Uh, hopefully, of course, uh, only a few patients so far. Uh, one, actually, of them, one got better and eventually extubated. Uh, so three or four of the rest of them, they didn't make it. So we have been using it, yes. And actually yesterday we saw a patient who was sent to us for the same purpose from another hospital. Uh, we did not start him on ECMO, but we started him on nitric oxide. And so far he's doing okay. And looks like less likely he would need that. Okay, let me um, go to Kaleem uh, Ahmed. Kaleem, you are unmuted, please. Um... I speak. Assalamu alaikum. Um, regarding this uh, IVIG, the Survival Sepsis Campaign and S uh, Society of Critical Care has a weak recommendation of not using it against uh, uh, IVIG in COVID-19. They have a data from published in the uh, Clinical uh, Infectious Disease uh, from Jiangsu province uh, when they have used this modality in COVID-19 patient and there was no significant outcome. Okay. The, um, so uh, now let me go to our... Um, uh, I, I just want to add, uh, is our uh, panelist. Uh, Fizia, you want to add something? Assalamualaikum. <clears throat> uh, uh, I just wanted to add, ask uh, what is the reason of the prolonged intubation? For instance, uh, after our cohort of uh, giving patients with 2 C Lizimab, we do see a very good response in means of uh, chest radiography getting cleared absolutely uh, rapidly and CRP is going down. But we have been seeing that they are still are on the vent and difficult for ventilation to be maintained and hypercapnia is the major problem that we are facing. So, I mean, uh, is it uh, uh, other nosocomial infections? We, uh, we are a little braver for TB, but, you know, why are we not being able to uh, wean them off? Um, Sadia, this is um, in generic all the patients, or you're talking about some of those that have COPD along with that or some other uh, elements as well? Is this your experience with every single patient you have done and how long you're talking about seven days okay three weeks, three weeks. yeah so the issue is that uh, for uh, all of the patients well they are on the vent and they for the rest of the patients whom we, we have not given to see the x-rays are as bad as it is so we do understand that it will take time uh, uh, for them to get better but for to see uh, there's a remarkable improvement in the x-rays and uh, we have not been able to do CT scans to give a better proper, you know, uh, uh, picture of it. However, the x-rays go absolutely clear uh, within 40, 24, 48 hours. However, our problems with uh, ventilations are still there and uh, hypoxemia is there, but more so uh, the PCO2, the perfusion is so bad that uh, we are not able with any settings to uh, bring them down. I mean, like a PCO2 of 90s and 100s is something which, you have, which we are facing. And for one of the patients, it's already been around 18 day of his admission. He's still not cleared of his uh, COVID. And he's got his TOSI. And I think now probably developed a, a WAP, but for that also, we've now stopped his antibiotic. He has very thick secretions. We've changed his tube a couple of times. And we keep on arguing about the question of get, getting an ETT, uh, the tracheostomy done, but that's a problem again in Pakistan. So, yeah, right. I, so, think, I think you're right. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I'll just uh, make a quick comment and I'll open it to the okay, rest sure, of the panel. Sure. Um, I think you're right. Some of these do take time and that sometimes is just the physiology of ARDS. Partly, sometimes you see high CO2 because many of us who do uh, ARDS quite a bit, we know that sometimes we lead to what we call as permissive hypercapnia with the low tidal ventilation with stiff lungs. So we sacrifice CO2 for the oxygen. Um, and then the third proportion, I would say there, is, there, there, has been, there have been some studies done that show that uh, the inhaled vasodilators as well, if you're not having a good success after tocilizumab. And the time, you know, these ARDS patients just take more time because so much damage to their um, to, uh, lungs. And then we cannot detail, uh, assess these days with a CD scan. I'll stop here and, you know, I'll open it to a very I, I, have, I have one question. I mean, in, as a continuation, uh, because in tocilizumab, now some evidence is emerging that, um, that there can be a rebound after use of tocilizumab. There can be a rebound in the storm. Uh, it suppresses and then it re-emerges. So have you seen that? Or what is your comment about it? Yeah, very good question. Um, we have seen in one, and that is why you can do, um, like he got better and started getting worse again, and we did use the second dose as well. Um, it's been there, I agree, in the literature as well, not a huge literature, but it's there. But what else can you do? I think in that circumstance, after the second dose, it, it, it is still going downhill. I will consider our last option that is convalescent plasma. So there is a question why ferritin is raised in the um, panel or labs? It's an inflammatory marker, just like CRP. Uh, one of the reasons for ferritin to go up is actually because it's a macrophage activated system. And most of the people believe that this is actually HLH, not directly actually as an inflammatory marker itself because your macrophage dies because of the IL-6 and also because inflammatory marker macrophage would die and then you'd release your ferritin. And that's one of the reasons that they are seeing high ferritin in these patients. And that's why they're also comparing with this is a secondary HLH versus MAS syndrome, which is pretty much like your CART syndrome too. But this, this atosilism app came in. Most of the data came from oncology. Thank you, Farhan. Um, now, one uh, question from the attendee is Mohammed Azim Imran. Uh, please go ahead and give your question, introduction and question. I am practicing family physician here in Faisalabad. I want to ask from uh, Mr. Fawad. Uh, for me, uh, actually, this is the cytochrome response and the virus. There is a challenge. There is a uh, going on war between these uh, two things. Uh, that is uh, the virus uh, response and the body response of this in terms of cytokines. Is there any predict uh, prediction or biomarkers available to, so we can uh, judge uh, pretend or pretend that this patient uh, will develop the cytokine storm so we can better intervene before the cytokine uh, settings uh, going on damaging our lungs? Yes, absolutely. Um, um, and I, I, I kind of mentioned, and it's in my protocol as well. So basically, uh, interleukin-6 itself may not be easy to do. So you follow uh, basically CRP, D-dimer, ferritin levels. If CRP is getting close to, if it is rising every day, getting close to 10, ferritin close to 1,000, D-dimer above 1,000, or all of, uh, just these are simple markers to do. These are raising in those numbers then you are heading towards cytokine release song. LDH is another one, close to 200, 250. But again, it's more rising and you know, the numbers they're getting up to. So you have to see really trending every other day or every day. In the same contest, what we have learned over the last two, three weeks that uh, the timing when you give the IL-6 inhibitors is hard to And if you anticipate the patient is, I mean, heading towards uh, cytokine storm uh, with all the inflammatory markers and clinical presentation or deterioration, I think it's better to give early rather than wait till late. So on the average, when patient is admitted, then we are giving within um, about seven days uh, about that time. So if we are late, then it's too late. Yeah. All right. I would say just do the basic lab the first day and every other day or second 
first five days be very aggressive with these inflammatory markers. And as Dr. Avesh said, I think within seven days, we're going to start those medications. Fawad Bhai, I have a question for you. Um, I've been seeing a lot of uh, uh, people, especially my friends and colleagues in New York City, they're doing a lot of early proning. So initial, the whole concept of early intubation was primarily run from uh, control of infection versus, oh my God, this patient's gonna die really quick on us. Now people are actually saying, because the mortality is so high, do not intubate this patient early. And they're saying, early proning, awake proning, negative suction, and all that. So what's your take on it? Okay, so that, uh, that's an area which is, uh, again, there are different online versus uh, evidence-based discussions. Not much evidence-based. So um, proning helps because most of the ARDS happens in the posterior part because posteriorly our lungs are huge. Um, so the reason for early intubation that was suggested earlier is to avoid various modalities like non-invasive ventilation to avoid, you know, high flow above 30 liters and just, just control it, control the patient, do the proning after intubation. So in our, so that was the reason behind um, early intubation to decrease the aerosolization plus do aggressive critical care management early on as opposed to Sometimes we try a CPAPs bypass in a non-COVID patient. Now, the question of should we not do it and prone it uh, because if mortality is high? The mortality is high because of multiple reasons. Um, uh, one of the reasons is not having those investigational therapies like some of the centers who are not overwhelmed. And overwhelming, if you have 40 ventilators, you have 80 patients, it's not easy, and that's happening in New York. It's not easy to manage those patients by non intensivists There are multiple uh, reasons there. Now, early proning without ventilation is actually not bad. I mean, if, but it is very difficult, um, like uh, keeping a patient steady short 16 hours of proning. It's not easy to do it without patient being intubated upside, like, you know, lying on his belly. Forget about 16 hours, 10 hours is difficult, but it's a good concept. I don't think so there is any significant evidence at this point that it will help better than incubation, but I will put it to other panelists. One comment I would want to make though, for if you are not intubating and patients can tolerate early proning, awake proning, some centers are doing it, I think do it. But if patients requires intubation, it's the bad. Then, no, no, uh, then they're going to be severe. When the PF, uh, PR, uh, PO2 FIO2 ratio is less than 300, I mean, uh, when we are seeing that they are on the monitor, as well as uh, there is a delay in the, in the time taken for ventilation. And that's what I'm also seeing with early use of steroids. Because when, in, when we see that they are hypoxemic and they have a high respiratory rate, and they, that is, uh, clinically they are in the severe category, and we start with the time thread early, then, uh, then we, uh, we see a little benefit in them. I mean, this is just this might be just subjective, but that's the initial data that we are seeing. And this is um, you, you, you're using steroids uh, once they are based on the inflammatory markers, or you're just using it once they're becoming more hypoxic. Uh, there, uh, there are see CRP comes pretty early. CRP and LDH, so uh, and right. the NLR ratio. So we are seeing the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio if it's raised. Um, and we're seeing quite a lot of that. I mean, 10, 15, 20. I mean, this is the NLR ratio that we're seeing. There's a lot of neutrophilia. Um, the PLC can be about 20, 25. And uh, with, the, with, the, with the neutrophilia present and lymphopenia. So a big NLR ratio, a high CRP count. And along with that, respiratory rate of more than 30 and hypoxemia. Um, uh, evident on ABGs or, or desaturation on, on the oxygen saturation, then we just hit hard because these people are usually presented on the fifth day or the sixth or seventh day. And we are thinking of now hitting hard and being a little aggressive uh, with them. Along with HCQ, we start with high breath and do cloning and see the results. And we are, uh, 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 the early thing is that I'm seeing, I'm observing that there's a delay in the time for uh, intubation. Do you give them any light sedation or anything? Uh, uh, for proning? 
No, and not yet. Is, no. So, and uh, you able to, I mean, they cooperate, the patients? Yeah, yeah. See, there are some who do cooperate, and where they, there is a, a, there is a subset of patients who just refuse and say, we can't do it. So then we don't force them. But whoever can, then we do insist that they should be uh, made prone. Yeah, we have a similar experience in our center as well, where we do encourage patients who are you know, quickly ramping up in terms of their oxygen requirements to try it. One thing that occasionally helps um, is to actually make the bed slightly reverse Trendelenburg, about 10 degrees or so, um, so that they don't feel like you know the intraocular pressure doesn't increase too much. And it becomes a little bit easier for them to tolerate having their um, sort of head on to the pillow. Um, secondly, and importantly, we try to keep these patients NPO starting that point, because if they're quickly going up, as you know, many, many people have already described, once you step on that ladder of increasing O2 requirements, some of these patients quickly progress to the point where they require intubation. So it can become a bit of a sign if you're thinking, you know, proning, intubation. If you're even thinking about it, remember, you probably want to make that patient NPO. Makes sense. Yeah, that's good. Oh, I think it would be good to share that data once you guys have more patients. It's very good, very refreshing to hear that you know that works well. Okay, I I I have a question for uh, Abbas uh, Masood because you are uh, having these anticoagulation more. There's a question about this. That do you think that unfractionated heparin is better than a low molecular weight heparin, or vice versa, or what is your? Uh, I mean. Uh, Unfractionated heparin has more anti-inflammatory uh, action compared to Lovenox, and the Lovenox uh, have more than uh, oral anticoagulants. So that's the status right now. Uh, but again, Lovenox is easy to be given, uh, and this patient has renal failure, and there is a reason that Lovenox cannot be given, we keep Lovenox. Uh, but patient with renal failure uh, with a TFR less than 30, they get heparin. Okay, let me uh, unmute Kaleem. He has some um, uh, comments. Yes, so um, I'm, I don't have personal experience, but uh, a colleague from Long Island, uh, in fact, my brother-in-law, um, he was reporting a lot of patients uh, who are intubated are difficult to sedate uh, and requiring multiple agents. Um, and uh, so I want to see what other panelist has. I think um, not much from my end. Um, mostly when they're proning, we paralyze anyways. So um, I, I have no problem. Uh, as I said previously, propofol versus propofol with paralysis versus versus pentanyl with paralysis is used. It has worked well. Um, it's just sometimes ARDS patients become difficult, but then, then when the paralysis hits and they're prone and all that, it works out well. Uh, but nothing out of norm on my end. Yeah, same way. I mean, most of the patients are paralyzed anyway, and the same then we use a propofol and the fentanyl also at the same time for pain. So this combination works pretty okay. So um, like uh, hearing from uh, some of the colleagues from Pakistan about their experience, uh, um, um, are they paralyzing the patient as well? Or Yes, yes. So we are using the safe And because our sedation is a major problem with us, we don't have fentanyl. So we are using propofol, dexmethadine, um, which is Presidex, or uh, midazolam and uh, ketamine. These are the options that we have. So we make a combo with uh, either propofol or ketofol. And still, if you have a problem, then, you know, Yes, the stage aquarium. So these are the options that we have available. Sentinel, we don't have. All right. So um, one uh, raise hand is from XT1254. I would request, okay, go ahead first. Um, uh, you're unmuted. XT1254. Um, you have to unmute yourself as well. Oh, yeah. I do not have any questions. Hello? Hello, uh, I do not have Okay, all right, thank you. I'll lower your hand. Okay, uh, so 
I think the uh, we are going over. So I would uh, say at this point to have a uh, one last round of our panelist. Uh, I'm wondering if anybody has any renal related issue. I mean, <laughs> I'm here to because I'm in the floor. Right. Yes. So, well, I had some points written for my presentation, which I would like uh, you to make. Well, we are seeing a lot of hyperkalemias and uh, metabolic acidosis on top of whatever respiratory acidosis we have. Yes, and we've already had two patients who've had required CRRT, but uh, what we're seeing is a persistent hyperkalemia in most of them. So a couple of them, not more. You do CRRT there? Yep, yep. Okay, great. So what we do is CRRT, actually we are doing a, like a short, like a, we call it a shift therapy and or PIRRT, six to eight hours. You don't have to do 24 hours. And we use very high, I mean, dialysate flow rate, like a 50 to 60 ml per kg per hour. And that has been working pretty good for us. Right, so, so we've so that, converted from infectious disease specialists to intensivists and nephrologists and cardiologists because of resource limited things. So we are supposed to do everything now. Uh, I would like to add on to that. I mean, I would like to ask about fluids because there's a lot of contention about how much fluid should be given. Uh, some people say that you have to restrict fluids, and then, then there's this risk of uh, this uh, uh, the, this thing about I mean uh, the, the heart and the kidney all all getting involved at the same time. So how much fluids should be given basically, or is that's it just a, case to case? That's a great question. Actually, that we, we learned over the last two three weeks. Initially, when we start seeing this patient and we were following like restrictive or uh, fluids given to patient, but then about second week, we realized that we are drying them a bit too much and that actually worsening their renal function. So uh, we try to keep a volumic. Uh, don't have to be hypervolumic, but please uh, don't dry the patient too, too much. So that's the lesson we learned over the last two weeks. All right, great. So um, yeah, I think that, that's a good, um, yeah, Abbas, you reminded me that uh, I think <clears throat> Going forward, we'll, uh, we'll uh, introduce our panelists as well as the speaker in the beginning so that people can tailor their questions according to the expertise of our um, panelists of the day. Uh, but for now, I would say let's have a um, quick uh, round around our panelists for our speaker or our any, anyone. Uh, just comments and and uh, so that then we can close today's session. Uh, Avas Masood, you are first. I mean, I think we discussed uh, pretty much a uh, uh, big, lot of topics. So uh, I think I would just wrap up from my perspective, from renal perspective, that uh, again, uh, don't uh, try to dry patient too much, but at the same time, make sure patient are not volume overloaded. And if we're using uh, CRRT or dialysis, you start using early. Uh, and you're anticipating that patient is going to renal failure. These patients need to be started uh, renal replacement therapy early rather than late. All right, thank you, Wes. Uh, Farhan, you're next, uh, you're unmuted. Farhan Kadir. Uh, unmuted. Haji. Yes. So I'm also a nephrologist and my only take is that um, I believe personally, based on my experience taking care of these patients, if you see an ARS looking patient treated with like an ARS and we have so much data how to treat them, but if you have a patient who actually has a very good compliance, please do not treat it like an ARS. Do not dry them out. These are the patients when I have an AKI. Early CRT versus late CRT, remember early CRT will release IL-6, which is documented evidence. So CRT comes with, with complication. If you need to treat it for ARDS, yes, please. If you're treating it as a thrombotic complication with the LTI, please do not switch your gear and try to treat them like an ARDS. That's the only thing I have. Thank you. Thank you, for, um, Farhan. Uh, next is Fibzia. Um Parikar, please go ahead. Yeah, I think um, it was an excellent presentation and uh, each time we get to learn things which we can further implement in our system. And I feel um, that uh, in some of the centers in Pakistan, we 
are doing whatever can be done and in these circumstances. So. Thank you, Fidia. Uh, Majid, you're next, unmuted. Thank you, um, Dr. Farad, for the excellent talk and to you know, everybody else for the wonderful questions. I would echo what everybody else said. I think um, the best uh, thing to do is to uh, practice evidence-based medicine even during a pandemic. So the reality is that even in peacetime, even in the best of times, we don't do a particularly fabulous job sticking to evidence-based medicine. And that is why the whole field of quality improvement exists. The reason is we know what needs to be done and yet we fail to do it. Even in the best of centers, the richest of centers across the world. And whenever folks have shown that they simply stick to what's um, borne out by evidence, outcomes improve even locally, even within the confines of one hospital. So remember, you know, what are the basics? There's lots of things to think about when it comes to ventilator management, ICU management. Um, I posted some links in the chat forum here. Folks can also save the entire chat. There is a, an icon to the right of the chat box. You can click it and save the whole chat for the day at the end of every one of these talks. But there's the fact trial that talks about making sure your patients remain dry. That can um, free up the ventilator up to two days ahead of time. There's the ABC trial that talks about daily um, sedation awakening trials and spontaneous breathing trials, which helps get patients liberated faster. These can help with mortality. There's good data on proning as well. Remember the basics and, and of course, embrace new data and new evidence when it comes to the four, but um, don't jump to doing fancy things that haven't yet been borne out by evidence. Because this is a, um, a mistake that humanity has already, uh, you know, commentary by an Italian uh, physician who is a bit of a celebrity in Europe, right? And he said, you know what? I think this isn't really typical ARDS. And unbeknownst right. to him, everybody threw out all that they knew about ARDS. And now they're all trying to do, like, looking for the fancy magic pill. And of course, who else, but, you know, at the forefront and us Pakistanis were always waiting for the miracle, the savior, right? The magic pill. I'm definitely a, um, a victim of that too. I'm definitely um, to blame for that. But I think we need to really stick to the basics and embrace new data when it shows us something of our value. Okay, great. Um, very good um, lessons uh, that we all should uh, remember. Majid, thank you. And uh, now let me once again try Mohammed Salim, if I can get him from Pakistan. Yes, Mohammed Salim. Hello. Gigi. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Gigi, Bilkul. Yeah. As Assalamu alaikum. It was a very nice presentation and very nice discussion. Uh, I had a question that there is increased mortality in hypertensive patients. So is that due to the involvement of ACE or some other mechanism? I think Avas, uh, you you can take it or um, uh, after that then uh, for what? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I mean, uh, that is, uh, Dr. Salim, uh, this has been a suggested mechanism that they might have more uh, expression of the ACE2, uh, actually ACE receptor, uh, or ACE, uh, ACE2 receptor. Uh, but again, that's again controversial because in some studies show that uh, ACE2 receptor could be protective also. So again, nobody knows uh, what exactly is the reason behind that. All right, so for Wad or Farhan, you want to add? Yeah, I'd agree with the rest. I, I think um, it's uh, it's not uh, literature proven at this point. There is controversy about it. Um, it's true that chronic lung conditions, including hypertension, diabetes, we have seen a bad outcome to the obesity. So, um, so yeah, nobody knows truly. Okay. Um, anyone else want to add? Farhan? Um, I don't think so. I have anything to add on. Just a bit that coexisting the coexisting condition does increase the risk, which we already know. So I don't really know if there's any correlation between the two, unfortunately. Okay. 
Great. So, Samreen, uh, Sarfraz, you're uh, the last um, in our round of uh, rounding up and concluding this session. Please go ahead. Um, uh, this was a great uh, talk. Uh, it covered most of the things uh, about severe patients. I would just like to say that in Pakistan, we are navigating between seeing a cytokine storm and the high endemicity of TB that we have. Tocilizumab is a double-edged sword. And we are uh, forced to use it, I mean, uh, based on just because we don't have like IGRA, the, the facilities to do IGRAs uh, urgently or uh, even Montum's test, and Montum's test is not even reliable in Pakistan. So I am dealing with TB quite a lot. I'm a TB specialist. So um, the thing is okay, balancing the fact that uh, there can be a TB deactivation uh, and not to use tocilizumab because of fear of TB is really difficult for us. And uh, we are just going ahead and taking a risk because right now it's, it's their life which is at risk and we can always take care of TB later on. <laughs> Sometimes we end up doing that. Right, right. So um, at the end, I would ask uh, both Samreen and Tivzia that if you and any of the other um, attendees from Pakistan um, know of other ID specialists from Pakistan, Pakistan ID Society uh, leadership, yes. Or, yes. so please forward their name and contact to us so that we can include them, learn from them, ask them what is going on in their part of the world and city and institution. Um, I think that that would be great for all of us. Sure. Dr. Sobia from K University. I know Dr. Sobia, ID specialist there. Okay, great. So please uh, forward uh, your, uh, you know, uh, to the apnamerit.com uh, and um, apnamerit at gmail.com as well as our WhatsApp group. Um, and Walid can also reach out to you to get those names, um, our coordinator. Sure. Thank you sure. Uh, all. Thank um, you, so thank you um, Fawad, uh, for a great presentation and panelists, always great um, group uh, and attendees. Uh, I, I always love attendees uh, without their participation and, and their um, you know, keen interest in uh, this um, activity, it, it cannot be that successful. So until tomorrow, thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Apna Thank you, Vavad. I love you. Thank you, everybody. Take care.